Hey everybody, Ian Bremer here, and I've got your world in more than 60 seconds. That's right, my little social contract with you. As long as we've got coronavirus, the least I can do is give you more than six seconds. That's the way it works. I got your questions here lined up, ready to go. Let's start it. Why hasn't Putin congratulated Biden yet? There's uh, there's no really good reason. Uh, at this point, pretty much every leader around the world has given the nod. Uh, as you know, Trump has not in any way conceded at this point. He may... Never. Um, I suppose at some point Putin may decide that he doesn't need to formally congratulate Biden. I mean, it's not like we're friends, right? I, the United States and Russia has a directly confrontational relationship, unlike the U.S. and China, where there is a lot uh, of uh, interdependence, uh, particularly economically between the two countries. That's not true with the U.S. and Russia. So you have virtually no trust and very little engagement. Uh, I will say that uh, the Biden administration will be interested in re-entering the Open Skies Agreement that we just left with the Russians, even though um, we're now uh, decommissioning the spy planes, so it may be hard for the Americans and selling them for scrap, so it may be difficult to get back in. Um, and the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement and New START. So there are things that Biden and Putin will need to work on And if Putin doesn't at any point officially say, good job, it makes it harder to start off on a decent footing. But I don't think, I mean, these are all adults. I don't think it ultimately matters that much. So I'm not losing sleep over it. I doubt that Biden is losing sleep over it. Probably Blinken, Avril Haines, uh, some of the incoming folks are starting to lose some sleep over it. And reaching out already to Russian diplomats saying what gives people. But ultimately, this is Putin's call. And, uh, you know, even though he hasn't gotten much at all from the Trump administration, uh, Trump himself as an individual has generally been well disposed to Putin, has never criticized the leader directly. Um, And, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, Putin personally calls the shots in Russia as opposed to the government as a whole. And so this is Putin's decision. So there, there you have it. Okay, what else do we have here? Um, how is the world responding to reports of a massacre in Ethiopia's Tigray region? Uh, very concerned. This is a big humanitarian disaster. It's the worst you've had in decades um, in Ethiopia. Uh, we, we've got about 5,000 refugees per day uh, streaming out of the Tigray region the Ethiopian government giving a 72 hour notice uh, to residents um, to uh, to get out or um, all uh, uh, or, or all hell breaks loose. They said they're going to start shelling these folks. Um, that would be a war crime. Um, you know, you're talking about a civilian population, uh, though the initial military strikes kicking this all off did come from the Tigray region itself. And this is all about, it's about economics. It's about power. It's 5% of the Ethiopian population that used to functionally run the government, uh, call the shots, had the Petra Patras networks, doesn't anymore. And they're not happy about it. Um, and uh, Ethiopia, the prime minister, Abe, is trying um, to make the country more democratic and not run uh, by a single ethnic group. Um, the group that has the most to lose, perhaps unexpectedly, is really upset about that. And I'll tell you, when I was in Ethiopia uh, right before the pandemic started, it was still uh, this year, um, there were so many well thought of Western oriented people around the prime minister who really had second thoughts about holding a democratic election simply because they feared that, uh, that, that moving the country away from ethno-federalism and run by a small minority was potentially very dangerous indeed. Um, but they, uh, anyway, that, that's, that's where you are. They held off on, on holding the election because of the pandemic. The Tigray region held it themselves um, illegally uh, and, uh, and declared that they were going to take over, or basically have self-rule, and uh, unless you're prepared to let them split off, and, and again, in many of these cases, that is a, a, a very challenging thing to do peacefully. Um, then there needs to be a resolution. And that resolution right now is a military one and, and potentially one that's going to uh, kill an awful lot of civilians. Uh, the United Nations has responded with grave concern 
getting humanitarian aid in there through the UNHCR. Um, the, uh, I mean, the United States has made a statement, uh, Europeans have made statements, but no one's doing anything about it, and nor would you expect it. So, I mean, really the question is, um, are they, is someone going to blink? Um, and, uh, and then could you avoid uh, this level of, uh, of violent conflict? Uh, we'll, see, we'll see where that goes. Uh, so your last question here is... Uh, BB and MBS, did they or didn't they meet? Well, the Saudis say they didn't meet, um, but uh, it's pretty clear that if Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister, is going on a private plane to uh, Neom, uh, where MBS also was and where Secretary of State Pompeo also was, uh, that they met. Uh, the Saudis uh, do not always tell the truth about uh, diplomatic-related stuff, as we know historically, um, and, and it's hard for them um, if they're, unless they're ready to actually normalize relations. Uh, on this issue, a much more conservative uh, Saudi population and a king who is still copus mentis and uh, is not as willing to engage directly with the Israelis until there is movement on a peace plan between Israel and Palestine, and there is, there is not. Uh, the Palestinians uh, are now engaging again diplomatically with Israel now that Biden is coming in, but there is no movement um, on a peace plan. Uh, you remember John Kerry, uh, that was his big deal, was trying to make that happen. Now, of course, he's a global envoy for climate, which frankly is not as heavy a lift as getting the Israelis and Palestinians to agree on land. Uh, talk about that. But uh, but look, it's clear they met, and it's clear it's a big deal, um, and uh, we are moving towards normalization. We've already seen that with uh, the Emiratis, uh, with Sudan, and with Bahrain. And Bahrain is, functionally, they don't have their own foreign policy. They, they take their messages from the Saudis. They were the ones that hosted that initial economic peace plan that was pushed by the Trump White House that was in Bahrain. Again, Saudi Arabia facilitated that. It was very much a one-sided deal. The Palestinians weren't really a part of it. Um, so obviously, Mohammed bin Salman has been interested in this normalization process for some time. If the king weren't around, if he were dead, um, and MBS became the king, um, I suspect we'd already have an announcement. It does feel like we're moving closer. It really does. And it wouldn't shock me if uh, this becomes a final win for the Trump administration before Biden's inauguration. Um, but, uh, you know, the uh, the fact is that the Middle East is in a very different position now than it was before. And I tell you, if I were advising Biden on this, I wouldn't be unhappy about it, especially because if you're Biden and you're trying to get the Iranians back into the nuclear deal, it's easier to do when the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Israelis are all engaged, normalizing relations and squeezing, pressuring Iran on a common front. It's a lighter lift for the Americans and Iran is uh, a, an antagonist of the US and America's allies in the region and it's very hard to come up with a deal with. So that's where we're going, that's where we are. Lots to talk about and, uh, and so nice uh, to be talking about international affairs again it's instead, of, uh, instead of all elections all the time. Uh, so I'll be with you all again uh, real soon. Have a great Turkey Day. Do your best. Be safe. Avoid people. Talk to you.